Thank you for coming and participating in our webinar uh, entitled Humanitarianism and International Medical Corps, a view from emergency medicine physicians. Uh, on behalf of SAEM, the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine, the Global Emergency, Me emergency Medicine Academy, and International Medical Corps, um, I'm Vinay Campbell, and I welcome you to our webinar. We have a really fantastic group of uh, emergency medicine physicians and other folks from IMC who are here. Um, we're excited to kind of explain um, the IMC story and uh, answer some questions that uh, may come up about uh, ways to get more engaged in humanitarian health. Um, I wanted to just start by talking a little bit about SAEM and GEMA. Uh, so the Global Emergency Medicine Academy is uh, a subgroup within the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine, which has several active subcommittees. And SAEM is comprised of emergency medicine physicians and trainees, um, so fellows and residents. Um, and we are, uh, within GEMA, we're uh, very interested in kind of thinking about academic global health and global emergency medicine from a variety of different ways. So we have a number of subcommittees, including um, a subcommittee focused on the basic emergency care course, uh, kind of outlined by WHO and the ICRC. We have a subcommittee based on uh, global emergency medicine fellowships and advocating for those. We have a subgroup uh, that really thinks about decolonizing global health and global emergency medicine in particular. We have a, a pediatric emergency medicine group that is newly formed. And uh, we here at the Humanitarian Task Force, which is a subcommittee that I co-lead, um, are really focused on uh, thinking about academic humanitarianism. And uh, we are invested in hosting webinars like this with excellent organizations such as IMC, and also thinking about humanitarianism from uh, uh, a scholarly perspective. Um, we are excited for people to join and participate in uh, GEMA and SAEM and uh, particularly Humanitarian Task Force. So in order to join SAEM, that is the link for you to um, to click on and kind of participate. Um, if you want to reach out to me individually, that's my email address and contact information on Twitter. Um, I uh, want to just briefly introduce the, the panelists. We have uh, an excellent group of panelists, Catalina, Joanne, John, Tara, and Saul, that uh, you'll hear a little bit more about them in detail. And I'm going to turn it over to Erica, my co-moderator. Thank you so much, Vinay, and, and thank you to everyone uh, for being here today. We're delighted to be here with SAEM and the GEMA team. Um, I'm Erica Tavares. I'm the Senior Director of U.S. Programs and Advancement for International Medical Corps. So I oversee our program, uh, Emergency Response and Healthcare Programming in the U.S., uh, but I've been with the organization for about 12 years and have uh, served in a variety of roles, including on the, the international side. So really excited to be here today uh, with my colleagues um, who have been with us uh, for a number of years out in the field um, and doing uh, the work as part of our emergency response. Uh, we have a lot to cover today. I'm going to try and jump right in. Um, toward the end of our conversation, there will be the opportunity uh, for us to take questions. Uh, but wanted to do a, a quick round of introductions. I'm joined today by Dr. John Roberts, the Emergency or International Medical Corps uh, Medical Director for our Emergency Response Unit. Uh, JR has led responses across the US and globally, including in Haiti, Ukraine, and uh, here in the US during COVID-19. Um, and he's also spearheaded International Medical Corps efforts to develop our World Health Organization classified emergency medical team, which we will talk more about uh, throughout our presentation. I'm also joined by my colleague, Joanne santos Alarcon, who's joining us from Ukraine today. Hi, Joanne, thank you for being here. Uh, she helps to drive our partnership efforts globally, uh, and particularly as part of our emergency response efforts and has been instrumental in helping us to build our roster. So thank you for being here. I know there'll be lots of questions for you about how people can volunteer. Um, and then uh, joined by Dr. Saul Kua, Catalina Gonzalez Marquez, and Tara Sood, all of whom have volunteered with us uh, during responses and in other capacities with International Medical Corps to help us drive forward our programming. So thank you so much for, for being here today. Uh, before we, we start talking um, with my colleagues, we did want to talk a little bit about International Medical Corps and who we are and what we do. So I will uh, share some slides. We will uh, try to make this part of the presentation move fairly quickly. Uh, and you can certainly find out more by visiting our website at internationalmedicalcorps.org. Uh, but International Medical Corps is a global disaster response and healthcare organization. Um, our mission is to improve the quality of life for vulnerable people vulnerable people through health interventions and work to increase self-reliance in the communities we serve. 
Uh, we are global. We have been around for nearly four decades. Uh, during that time, we've delivered about $3.94 billion in programs and services across 80 countries. Um, and we currently have uh, approximately 8,000 staff, uh, many of whom, over 90% of whom, are, are hired from and local to the communities where we serve. Um, the countries in, in dark blue here you can see is our current footprint. Um, we do have programs, as you can see, uh, globally. Um, we are responding to some of the world's largest crises today, um, including the crisis in Ukraine. And we do have teams on the ground in both Turkey and Syria responding to the earthquakes that happened there earlier this week. And we'll talk a little bit about the work that we're doing there. Um, in addition to emergency response, um, International Medical Corps prioritizes uh, delivering health care and health related services. Uh, you can see along the bottom there the types of, of health care programming that we offer, um, the services that, that we work in partnership uh, with local governments and communities to provide. Um, but probably most importantly, um, you know, training underpins all that we do. The, the organization was, was founded uh, in Afghanistan um, during uh, the 1980s and in response to the, to the Soviet invasion there. When our founder uh, went in to provide medical care and really realized he could not ever bring in enough doctors uh, to provide that care that was needed and so started training local medics on the border, um, some of whom went on to work for International Medical Corps and were parts of our program for a long time. Uh, we still do have a footprint in Afghanistan and, and in Pakistan. And so um, that sort of a foundation of training is, is continues to be important to the work that we do today. Uh, some of the things that, that distinguish International Medical Corps are, are, are hallmarks of the way we work. We do get there first. Um, we are um, highly flexible and adaptable in our emergency response teams. We have a great logistics and security team that help us get uh, on the ground quickly if we're not already there when a disaster strikes. We're often there within 24 hours. Um, we do go to some of the toughest places. Um, you know, we don't um, station our programs in capital cities. Um, we do go out into communities where the healthcare needs to be delivered, um, whether that's responding to a COVID-19 um, outbreak here in the US and going to rural communities that are underserved or um, you know, reaching communities um, across the world that need healthcare services and don't have regular access to them. Uh, as I mentioned, we train, we do prioritize making sure we're working in collaboration with ministries of health, with local communities to, to provide training and to build capacity so that the healthcare system on the ground um, can continue to be stronger as we move forward. And we stay, um, we are committed to really building more robust healthcare systems and increasing access to care for people around the world. And so we may go in during a disaster, that's often how we enter um, a country, but we will stay as long as we can continue to, to fill gaps and have the resources to do so. Um, when we look at our emergency response, you can see some of the responses from the last several years. This is just a sampling of them. We've done uh, much more than that, but we do define emergency in the broadest sense of the word. Uh, we respond to um, natural disasters um, like the earthquakes, um, but we also respond to crisis, disease outbreaks, and um, you know, long-term or kind of chronic emergencies like drought um, across the Horn of Africa. You can see some of, some of the places that we've responded uh, most recently here. Um, again, we have flexibility to respond where we're needed most, and so that includes a whole different range and size and scale of responses. Um, and we're able to do that, um, again, because of our, our very significant logistics capacity. We have a, a very strong logistics team that we're able to partner with to make sure that, that our doctors, our, our volunteers, our medical professionals can be on the ground quickly when needed. Um, but we also have the materials uh, to make sure that our, our teams um, have what they need to do their job. And so that includes, um, you know, we have the capacity to, to deploy an emergency response health facility um, or multiple facilities. We maintain 10 shelters. Um, we can treat 50 to 100 patients each day. Um, and so we pre-position uh, roughly 50 tons of medical equipment and supplies in addition to pharmaceuticals um, globally. Uh, because of that capacity, because of the long, uh, long term nature of the work that we do, uh, we were, uh, we did apply for and were classified as a World Health Organization uh, Type 1 emergency response unit, uh, both mobile and fixed. Um, some of you may be familiar with that classification. It's an effort by the World Health Organization to verify the capacity of organizations who are responding to meet healthcare needs after a disaster. 
Um, we are the only nonprofit organization in the world with both fixed and mobile type one capabilities. Um, you may have also seen this uh, in recent days in, in response to the Syria and, and uh, Turkey earthquakes, where the World Health Organization is actually calling for type two and type three, which are uh, more robust facilities. And so this is um, you know, part of the process of how that's worked. You can get called up during an emergency. Um, and we are talking with them at this time about the potential uh, to deploy, although we have not been called yet. Um, but what this means is that we have the ability to deploy a health facility supplies and medical staff and systems needed to function uh, in the aftermath of a disaster and be fully uh, self-sustainable. Um, so to leave the smallest uh, possible footprint um, when we arrive um, and, and then when we, when we later leave. Um, we can provide care uh, through these facilities for up to 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we can treat 50 to 100 patients a day, depending on the type. Um, this is um, the kind of deployment that we will often use volunteers in if and when this is called up. Um, and then we have also, over the uh, last several years, and really um, in the aftermath of COVID, have also increased our ability to respond within the United States. Um, we have, um, since Hurricane Katrina 2005, uh, responded to natural disasters primarily in the U.S., but um, with the outbreak of COVID-19, um, we really saw a need and, and the opportunity to support health systems here in the United States. Um, and so we uh, were able to surge our response to bring um, facilities, uh, medical surge staffing, supplies, and training um, to health facilities in the U.S. And we worked ultimately with about 250 healthcare facilities uh, hospital, hospital systems, long-term care facilities to provide services during COVID-19. Um, and these are just a small number of our partners who help us, um, particularly on the volunteer side. Um, we work with these organizations to recruit volunteers to help build our roster uh, for deployment here in the U.S. and internationally. We'll talk a little bit more later today about um, how we do that and how you can sign up if you're interested in volunteering with, with International Medical Corps. Um, and so um, we'll kind of stop the, the, the slides here and I will um, go back to my colleagues um, and uh, hear from them directly about why they volunteer with International Medical Corps um, and how um, they balance that with their, with their day jobs. Um, so um, I'll ask each of you to do a really quick introduction, um, you know, just one or two sentences about yourself, but then also, um, you know, would love for you to share sort of your why, why you do this work and why you've made humanitarian response um, part of your career. Um, and Catalina, if you don't mind, I would love to start with you. I was hoping I wouldn't go first. <laughs> but, hi, everyone. I'm Catalina Gonzalez Marquez. I'm an emergency medicine physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And um, I also do global health research in research denied settings, but started working with International Medical Corps um, as a fellow um, when I was doing a global health fellowship, just as a volunteer. Um, and then have grown in the organization and really happy to have had that journey with them. And I guess my why, um, I was always curious about humanitarian work. Um, and I was also really curious about it because I didn't always see people with my background kind of in humanitarian work. I always saw other people doing it and was also really curious about that too. And um, I am a researcher, but I think to really research the thing, really know about the thing, you actually have to do the thing and do the on the ground work and be there and really know what's happening. And so um, I can't wait to share with you all my experiences with IMC. Uh, over to the next one. Thank you so much. Um, Saul, do you want to go next? Sure, can everybody hear me okay? Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Oh, thanks. Uh, good morning. Yes, uh, my name is Saul. Uh, I am also an emergency physician and also, I think, 2009 graduate of uh, Columbia's Global EM Fellowship. Um, I would say probably global health was always in my cards. Uh, I started off pretty young studying archaeology and medical anthropology. I would say probably I spent most of my doing work in the field. In the Middle East and Africa. And so eventually, I guess I shifted over to medicine. Uh, once completing residency, I guess it seemed like the most 
logical like next step would be to do a fellowship with uh, training in, in public health. And so for those of you that know, like Columbia's uh, public health component is uh, largely focused on humanitarian crisis uh, and forced migration. Um, and so I guess that's what led me into the career path uh, um, with humanitarian response. And uh, so I guess now more than a decade later, um, I'm still here. Thank you. Thanks so much. Tara? Hi guys, I'm Tara Sue. I apologize for the background noise. I am in an airport. Um, so I, I, um, I'm a graduate of NYU Bellevue residency program, and I started volunteering in humanitarian aid seven years ago, and I haven't gotten enough of it yet. Uh, my why is sometimes the large problems in the world, like refugee crisis or genocide or large scale natural disasters, they make you feel so powerless. And doing this work, uh, it allows me to be part of the solution, which keeps me from feeling hopeless. Thank you, Tara. Appreciate that. Um, JR, I, I wanted to turn to you as well um, and hear your why. Um, JR uh, started with us as a, as a volunteer and then was hired by International Medical Corps. But um, JR, maybe after you talk a little bit about sort of how and why you get into this work, you can also um, talk a little bit about International Medical Corps' ongoing response right now in, in Syria and Turkey. I want to make sure we, given that um, it just happened earlier this week, at least talk a little bit about what we're, what we're doing there and what we're seeing on the ground. Of course, absolutely. Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent. Hey everyone, my name is John Roberts. I'm an emergency physician uh, in Los Angeles. I trained at LA County and then did my disaster medicine fellowship over at Carolinas in Charlotte. And uh, I started with IMC back in 2020, right during the pandemic. Uh, I had been a volunteer before that, but they, uh, but they brought me on to help design medical protocols for the EMT process, as well as to, uh, to help with the COVID response. And then I've had a couple of, uh, of uh, different jobs since then. I actually was the previous uh, Erica, and uh, Erica is much better at it than I am. And I moved over to more of a technical role in the emergency response unit, and I'm currently the emergency medical advisor uh, or medical director of the ERU, and I also... Uh, uh, do technical advice for the, the U.S. programs as well. And my why, I guess I, so I'm from Mississippi and uh, I got started in Katrina. We, uh, it, it, Hurricane Katrina came straight through our coastline and destroyed the entire coastline. And we were down doing cleanup and it was about a million degrees outside and it was mucky and we were sleeping in tents and I just remember this lady coming up to us and just telling us that she said we we would be nowhere without y'all. And I was hooked from there. I was like, this is where I want to be. I want to be in places that that need this amount of help. And then quickly, uh, so that I went to medical school because of that, went to emergency medicine residency because of that, and then realized throughout several different uh, responses that the need seemed to be global significantly more than anything local, but that we couldn't forget local responses. And so that led me to IMC and, um, and sitting in front of you. So I am um, a little bit about uh, kind of where we're at. Uh, again, I, like I said, I'm the emergency medical advisor for our emergency response unit. And uh, several days ago, we had a very large crisis happen on the border of, uh, of Turkey and Syria. And so a little bit about kind of what's going on there right now. Uh, I'm sure all of you have uh, seen the news reports, but currently uh, there was a 7.8 magnitude earthquake that happened in southern Turkey around Gaziantep. Currently, there are about, there are about seven, a little over 7,000 people reported dead between the two countries. It's affected about 23 million people, including about one and a half million children. And uh, unfortunately, it's in an area that's also experiencing some pretty significant weather. So the rain and snow have been predicted. 
and have been seen over the last week or so and are predicted to continue, which is going to uh, really complicate things. IMC, however, has been in Syria since 2008 and was in and had country programs in Turkey from 2012 to 2018. So this is an area that we have a lot of experience in. We, before the crisis, we were working in uh, Syria and about 12 different of the governances as and supporting about 30, between 30 and 40 health facilities that uh, were providing both physical and mental health services uh, to around half a million people uh, a year. Um, and so we have also been active in the area of Gaziantep, but also Hatay and uh, Salinurfa and Kalis and Mersing, providing health and MHPSS, which is mental health and psychosocial support, uh, gender-based violence and child protection programs uh, prior to the response. Since the response started, we have delivered about 15 tons of medications and medical supplies and cholera kits and, uh, and uh, medical commodities. And those have mostly gone to facilities in Syria because that's where our programs are currently uh, in Aleppo and Hama and, uh, and Latikia. We also run three mobile medical units in the Northwest part of Syria that provide primary health care and trauma and sexual and reproductive health services to about a thousand patients a week. And in Turkey, we are currently actually working through local partners to procure and distribute uh, food and non-food items to some of the affected communities. And this is something that we actually do a lot of, which is we try not to come into an area that we don't understand or that we don't have a presence in previously and just start working. Our modus operandi, our way of doing things is that we, to the greatest extent possible, utilize local local organizations, local people, and the host community to provide care through those mechanisms rather than trying to bring in our way of doing things. And so that's currently what we're doing in Turkey and in Syria. We have uh, our entire team, almost our entire team is local as well. So did that answer your question? It does. Thank you, JR. I appreciate, appreciate that response. Mm -hmm. um, for JR and, and, and for Tara, um, you know, in our, our conversations leading up to today's call, we talked a lot about um, how you integrate humanitarian work, um, how you've done that um, into your career and how you made the decision for you, JR, to kind of come on full time. But Tara, I know it's, it's also something that you're, you're looking at as well, how you integrate um, volunteering into your career. And I guess starting with you, Tara, can you talk a little bit about how you how you integrate this work into your, your day jobs and, and a little bit about what's worked and what hasn't worked for you? Sure. Um, I actually started off with an organization that requires a year commitment minimum. And I took a sabbatical from work. I was supposed to deploy to a refugee camp uh, on the border of Tanzania and Burundi. I got all my vaccines, uh, ended up getting autoimmune thyroiditis, went into thyroid storm, got so sick that I had to be taken off of my assignment. Um, and by the time I recovered, my sabbatical had whittled down and I didn't have the whole year left. And I had to change course and look for organizations that do shorter deployments, which worked out in the end because I got to experience multiple types of crises and responses. And over the years, I've been able to keep it going because I can schedule my shifts uh, in a way to clear out my schedule for two to four weeks at a time. So a pro tip would be September, October, when it's uh, hurricane season, I schedule fewer shifts so I can easily get out of them. And that's worked for me over the last seven years. <laughs> Thank you so much. JR, how about you? So I, uh, I, I went a little bit more, uh, I went a little bit more deep uh, than, than, than Tara. I, uh, I, after leaving fellowship, I started in the community and really tried to, as much as possible, stay deployed for the entire time. I knew that I wanted to do this full time, but I knew that I wanted to continue to do clinical work. And if you want to do those two things, it's really difficult to find a uh, an organization to to do that with. I wanted to be in the nonprofit space because I had 
worked with governments before, and I had worked with for-profit uh, companies before, and that I found that, unfortunately, other priorities got in the way of the work. And whenever it came down to doing the thing that needed to be done, it was only the nonprofits that were able to do that because they weren't, a, they weren't, their, their reason for existing was not to make profit. And their reason for existing was not larger political issues. So that when the, when the decision came to be made, the hard decision, we have the mandate to make the right one and have the fewest other I guess, uh, complicating decision, uh, complicating factors to consider in the decision making. That's why I decided to go with the nonprofit sector as opposed to government or for for profit. But the I uh, like I mentioned, it was a little bit harder to be able to balance those two things with the clinical work and for in the public health work. And International Medical Corps was was um has been was and has been amazing in allowing me to continue my clinical practice. So I work Monday through Thursdays uh, with IMC doing all of the stuff that we've already talked about. And then every Friday afternoon, I work at an uh, at a hospital in downtown Los Angeles uh, doing emergency medicine. So I get both my gunshot wounds and my public health uh, at the same time. And I could not have done that without without the support of Erica and uh, and our leadership team to allow me to do those three things. And I've been uh, incredibly grateful for that. Thanks, Jared. And I, I would just add, I think International Medical Corps also understands and, and prioritizes that our, our doctors also want to maintain their, their clinical shifts and that experience. Um, it only helps us do our work better in the field. So it's been a real... Um, benefit for us to be able to have doctors on staff that also continue, continue their, their clinical practice. Um, I know when all of you have been thinking about this, sort of your, your situations have evolved over time. And, and Catalina, I'm wondering if you can um, kind of start and talk just a little bit about how your kind of journey with, with humanitarian work has evolved um, and the different types of, of things that you've done. Yeah, so I really have to thank the start of my journey in International Medical Corps to my uh, former fellowship director at Brown, um, Adam, who really connected me with International Medical Corps and gave me the support when I wanted to go on my first few responses. Um, and I think that was important, but my initial journey with International Medical Corps was I was on their volunteer roster, like I think many, many of us started and a couple of things happened in the world and I was able to go, you know, I was the doctor in, in a tent in the Bahamas. Um, I went to the Philippines for some COVID preparations and did all that with International Medical Corps. And um, that was great, but I have to say my impact was really small, right? It was, my impact was the patients that I met in the tent or the, you know, the five doctors I met, you know, at their hospitals. And then um, IMC actually kept calling me, which was great. I guess I did a good job. <laughs> I was nice enough to work with. And actually during COVID reached out to me to help them create like infectious disease protocols for hospitals or trainings for hospitals in both English and Spanish. And so I was able to, that, to do that and realized, oh, wow, I was actually impacting much more people, like, you know, 20, 30, maybe hundreds of people. And then um, again, IMC came back this year um, and this was a much bigger um, journey for me. And I have to say a really rewarding one. They asked me to be the course director and lead a basic hemorrhage control course in Ukraine. And that was an, a great experience into creating a course with you know, my expertise in acute trauma care, um, then designing what it would look like, adapting it to a conflict setting, um, an active conflict setting, and then going there, setting it up and delivering it multiple times um, and being in the field and also being able to share this technical expertise with the Ukrainian national staff. And, you know, again, just hope, hope to keep working with IMC because um, it's not, I'm not always the most helpful person when I'm in the field, right? You think you need a doctor all the time. The truth is that's not true. <laughs> you probably need someone who has other skills than a doctor. Um, but there are so many other ways. And again, because training is such a core piece of what IMC does, um, being able to have that um, different impact has been really rewarding. 
Thanks. And I think, Chair, if I'm not mistaken, we're now taking that training to other countries as well. Is that correct? Actually, yes. We, uh, thanks to Catalina and uh, all of our technical experts uh, on in Ukraine, we were able to put together a program that has broad applicability outside of Ukraine. And so we have had, uh, we've had requests from several countries in East Africa, including Ethiopia and Somalia, as well as we are also in discussions with uh, both officials in Syria and Turkey to deliver trauma and mass casualty training to doctors and nurses and pre-hospital care workers, as well as the uh, the wider public. So uh, thanks to Catalina and, and her team and uh, the team that she worked with at IMC, we were able to to turn that into something that is going to be scalable and really, a really exciting project. Um, Saul, for you, I know you've also, um, you've been with International Medical Corps, I think, on and off for, for a number of years. So um, we'd love to also hear from you sort of how your experience with humanitarian work has evolved and, and how it's changed, you know, and how you look at it. Yeah, very good. Yeah, um, as kind of alluded to, I guess, I've been in the humanitarian industry for, you know, quite a long time. And so um, I'll actually be looking at some notes because I just do want to be mindful of time and just try to cover uh, a brief kind of description of guys, my course as um, per the question. Um, and so I, I probably spent most of my time being a bit field focused and in particularly on the acute phase, acute phase of response, kind of the rescue phase of response. Um, and so this would like primarily include assignments of, that were more kind of exploration or setup, uh, some startup programming, um, project startups uh, to the same time. And so uh, to do this, uh, I had to kind of work out a bit of a flexible domestic schedule, um, primarily to achieve two things, uh, to have a, a short lead time uh, for deployment, to be able to get out there uh, very fast, and also to try to offer as much time uh, as possible. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, over the years, this has worked out uh, pretty well. Um, so as a result, I've uh, worked in many of the highest level emergencies uh, of the past decade, uh, anywhere from like the Haiti earthquake uh, to Ebola um, to to the Gaza war, just you know, just to name a few. Um, with the field assignments, I have uh, uh, picked and choosed a bit, um, particularly to try to keep my skills uh, broad and to include all categories, classes of emergencies, um, and so. Uh, I've done responses to conflict uh, or high insecurity context, what we call HICs, um, outbreaks, natural disasters, uh, famine. Uh, and again, kind of uh, most of these were uh, in the acute phase. Um, I do have less experience in recovery and development, um, probably almost no experience in those. Uh, and uh, in the acute phase, uh, the role I mostly served with either as leadership or the coordinator level. Uh, and some of the contracts that I've had uh, have ranged from independent uh, to actually uh, full-time contracts as well. Uh, I've done a little bit of work at the headquarters level, uh, developing emergency response strategies. Uh, I did some stuff on institutional theories of change, um, but I was probably kind of kicking and screaming a little bit while I was doing those. Uh, but eventually I learned a great deal from it, uh, brought it back to the field and tried to improve field response. So I guess in terms of my, my course, I've always preferred the field overall. Um, it's uh, probably the old kind of hitchhiking archaeologist kind of hidden in here somewhere working. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's my course in a nutshell. Thanks so much, I appreciate that. Um, for all of you, I guess, what is one thing that you wish you knew before you had started your humanitarian work that, that someone had told you about either what to expect or what it was going to be like? I'll, I'll pick on Tara. Tara, I'll let you go first. Oh, no, you're muted. There you go. Nope, still muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm saying I'd be happy to go first. So it's not Catalina again, but my technical difficulties are getting in the way. <laughs> so I, I would say that uh, the thing that 
I, I wish somebody had told me or I, what I would tell someone else is don't wait for the perfect time to volunteer on a project because these things always, these opportunities always pop up when your life kind of gets in the way, try to make time for it. Like uh, my first assignment with IMC, I got the email asking if I can deploy within 48 hours. I was again in an airport coming back from uh, Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria deployment. We didn't have water or running water or electricity the whole time we had been there and my whole team had picked up bed bugs. So we were very itchy and dirty. Uh, and we're sitting in the airport and I got the email from IMC and I am so glad that I said yes, because if I hadn't said yes, it was very tempting to say I can't because I would like to go home. Uh, but I did get to go to Dominica uh, with IMC as my first deployment. In addition to being introduced to IMC, who I love working with, I also made a lifelong friend. Joanne was actually my field coordinator in Dominica so just say yes there the perfect time will never pop up the way you expect it to thank you sorry about the bed bugs we've had those too <laughs> um so I'll ask you to go next we'll mix it up a little great yeah um yeah I guess uh you know one of the things you know we uh, even though I spend a fair amount of time in the field, even as an undergraduate or in medical school, you know, going as get into humanitarian response was a bit kind of you know abstract. It was an idea that that uh, I wanted to follow, and then you end up actually going to the field. You you know get your hands dirty and you you know, start to build some experience with it. And I would say probably one of the things that um, you know in the abstract sense was really never prepared for was the amount of oftentimes like kind of devastation and and the mortality the kind you 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 deal with out there um i remember doing uh you know an assignment uh with a severe acute malnutrition complex uh, stabilization unit and we were literally having a child pass away like every day and we would almost morbidly celebrate the day that we didn't actually have a you know a passing and so uh, it was one of those things that initially was never really prepared for, and um, I know organizations are, you know, very fantastic uh, with IMC and so forth that have psychosocial units to kind of help out with that, to kind of counsel with it. But you know, it is it is kind of very different out there from what you're, uh, what we kind of work with here. Sometimes the amount of death that we deal with is can be quite uh, uh, quite high, quite burdensome, and uh, um, it is in some ways kind of some of the reasons why you keep going back to at the same time because the need is very high. At the same time, but yeah, I never really knew how much we'd get into, you know, once we get out there. How how do you keep going when the situations are like that versus the things that you you've learned to do? Oh, it, it depends. Like I guess how you know when you keep going in the field. Um, I always say like the acute phase response is a bit of kind of managing your BTUs and your British thermal units, your amount of energy. So you're really just kind of constantly working and trying to like you know, keep up. Um, one of the things I find that's most useful is the people that you work with, your team out there are, are champions in their own world. And we kind of work together to try to keep each other in, in check. Uh, you know, could be anywhere from, you know, my water engineer saying, um, you know, Saul, just stop that fight and let's just work on this, you know, you know in, instead. And uh, you keep in touch with these people. Um, you still chat about uh, um, things outside of those events because you do try to, you know, forget it as much as possible. But uh, um, you know, the people you work with, the team that you work with, keeping them moving, keeping them motivated. Uh, I think that's one of the best fields that we have out there. Thanks, Catalina. Yeah, I think I, I echo a little bit of what Saul was saying, you know, there's going to be a lot that you see that's really frustrating. And that's, um, you know, you can get really mad about it, or you can do something about it, which is kind of the thought that I do to keep me going. Right? Like, if I have a skill that I can employ right now, I can be really frustrated about 
power structures, about things that like have made this this way, because, you know, I think unfortunately we live in a world where geography can unfortunately be destiny for a lot of people. Um, or you can use your skill and do something about it. And I think part of that's the emergency medicine doctor in me that is triage and do what you can and move on. Um, but more personally, I think one of the things that I wish I had known, um, and I experienced it probably a lot because my second trip to Ukraine was during like a really active time and a lot of sheltering, a lot of shelling is, um, be clear with your family, and your loved ones when you're going. Um, I think anyone who works in the humanitarian sector, we have like a really big risk tolerance, right? Um, and even emergency medicine physicians or physicians in general, right? We're uncomfortable, we're comfortable with discomfort. We, um, we, we take on a lot more risk than most other people would. And I think um, maybe um, one of the things I learned was to, you know, give them as much information, but also I think one of the things that I also learned was to also like put up boundaries. It's not helpful if you text me about a shelling that you saw in the city that I'm in because I've known about it three hours before you did. <laughs> um, you know, also putting up boundaries so that you can do your work. Um, but yeah, you know, maybe be clear to them. And you know, my my response is to minimize. Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Not always so helpful for your family. So um, be clear, but also to put up boundaries that are helpful so that you can do your work. Um, set up like communication expectations, like when you can communicate, when you won't be. I think were some of the more helpful things I recently learned. And Vinay is laughing because he was there with me. <laughs> JR, do you agree? Could not agree more. They, uh, all of y'all have said it much better than I could. Uh, it is, uh, I go back to, uh, you know, the thing that they say on MRAP all the time, which is what you do matters. And the reason why I say that is because it's really, really easy to get despondent and frustrated that you're not doing more, but doing this work is a lot like working in the ER. You are bailing water out of a ship with a hole in it. And the it is really, really easy to get burned out and frustrated and despondent when you are working so hard and it doesn't seem to be changing anything because you can't change the reason why 4 million people fled across the border. You can't change the reason why, you know, uh, people are, you know, dying by gunfire. But you can change the things that you can change. And what you're doing is incredibly important. And remembering that and remembering that it is a marathon, not a sprint. You have a life to lead, not you're, you're going, you have a life to lead. And if you can't do this work anymore, then you're not, then that's one less person doing the work. So making sure that you take care of yourself and understanding that you can only do what you can do. Uh, I wish somebody had drilled that. And everybody tried to tell you it too, right? When you first start, everybody's like, this is going to be a thing. And you're like, nah, man, I'm good. Don't worry about it. I'm, I'm tough. I'm filling the blank macho thing. And you're not, and you're, and listen to the folks that have been doing this a while because it they've learned a lot of really important things so that was what I, that was the most important thing I learned. Um, i'll turn this on its head a little bit and i will also um ask joanne the same question joanne um does deploy with us as as part of our teams to help um help uh, you know, our volunteers when they are on the ground and kind of be that that point of contact with them um, or has done so in the past. And so I guess, Joanne, for you, what's one thing you wish everybody who was coming in knew? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so uh, I guess the one thing that I wish clinicians knew coming into the field, and I'll be very specific to clinicians, is that you are going to be doing things that have absolutely nothing to do with your medical degree. Um, and I think that is the thing that people don't really realize. Like, yes, obviously we need your expertise. We couldn't do what we do without you. Like there's no way we could come and help as many people as we can without an MD, an RN, you know, uh, an NP, like everything. But sometimes you will be asked to do things where you're going to be looking at us with like, you have a second head growing out of you and uh, you want me to do what? <laughs> Why? I'm sorry. We need hands. Can you please just, you know, help put this tent up? And you're going to be like, oh, oh, okay. Um, 
and it's it's interesting to me because at first there can be some pushback because you know it's like but I'm an MD I thought I was going to come and do this no you are a volunteer and whereas yes we want your clinical experience we want all of you <laughs> your your hands your feet to your strength your knowledge all of that so um I wish that is a thing that most people knew that that uh you will be asked to do anything and everything when you are deployed um and I guess from a personal perspective one thing that I I wish I knew was that there was an that NGO work was possible. Um, so being a Latina and being, you know, first generation, second generation, whatever the terminology is, um, you're told very young that there are very much big careers that you aspire to and that are there to help you. Um, and a lot of the times, especially with uh, our generations, what you want to do is give back and you don't really necessarily know how. And the fact that NGO work exists and that this is something that you can do um, with your amazing skills is is something that is great and it's a different way for somebody to give back other than you know just money or you know reviewing something or whatever it may be that this is actually a possibility and that it's something that is needed i wish i had known that earlier thank you um jr but before we um before we go to sort of the, the the how you can give back joanne and some of the nuts and bolts of how how people what it means to volunteer with us Jer, I did want to ask, and we do have a. Um, I did. Uh, I did want to. Um, we did get this question from um, one of our, our participants um, when they registered, and hoping you talk a little bit about it. Um, we've been talking a lot about how sort of in a response, international medical corps volunteers sort of go in, um, and we've we've mentioned a little bit about how we make sure we're working with the communities, but it is. Um, one of our priorities and very important to us that that we always work um, to support the existing health system and to work with local communities to support um, their solutions to building healthcare capacity and training, and that we're not coming in and setting up a parallel system or we're not working outside, um, you know, the government priorities um, or the other priorities that are on the ground. And just hoping you can talk a little bit more about that um, and what you've seen and sort of how we structure that so that we are able to bring in outside help, but we're not doing so in a way that's, you know, coming in on top of the, the community um, and the local priorities and leadership that's there. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you asked this question, because this is something that that is embedded into the way that we do things. Uh, and also, uh, Danae, I didn't even realize that there was a subcommittee on decolonizing emergency medicine. That's amazing. So shout out to everybody that's on that subcommittee. Keep doing that work. I uh, Anybody that's been doing this job for any length of time will tell you that the way not to do things is to bring things in from the outside, including people uh, stuff, ways of doing things. The local community that you're serving is not helpless. They may have had something horrible happen to them, but they, they are resilient folks that have been doing things for a long time before you got there. And so we take that to heart in everything that we do. So the way that we go about this is, is that we try to set up as many country missions as possible. Because when we do that, we're able to find local expertise and local talent for long periods of time and make sure that we're putting resources back into the community that we're operating in. So that's the first way, is that if we could have a country mission in every country, that's what the way that we would do it, because we would be able to utilize local folks the entire time. But if we can't do that, we also maintain relationships with the local organizations and the local agencies that govern or are a part of the areas in which we work. So we maintain relationships with uh, all of the ministries of health in the places that we work. We never go in without the ministry's blessing. We, ne uh, we never go in without having local responders alongside, alongside us. And as quickly as possible, whenever we are on the ground, we transition over to local folks as fast as possible. So I'll give an example of, uh, of Haiti, the last, uh, the last earthquake in 2021. We brought in, we didn't have a, our country program actually wasn't able to 
sustain itself. Uh, and it actually had to close down, I believe, in 2016 or 2017. So we didn't have a country program that was there. And so we brought, we were asked by the Ministry of Health and the WHO to come in and set up an e emergency medical team uh, down outside of Lakai. And we set it up and we were seeing about 100 patients a day for the first month and a half. But after that, after a month and a half of expats, we quickly transitioned over to local doctors and nurses. And by the end of the program, almost all of our local medical staff were all of almost all of our medical staff were local and most of our water and sanitation staff as well as our MHPSS staff were all local and that is we and uh, we we did the same thing with Ukraine we recently transitioned from the ERU where I work to our our international program section which um, is able to set up long-term contracts with local with local labor procure things locally and to and to really make sure that the the response is, is by with and for the community that they work in so uh, that thank was you. sorry that was a bit verbose i apologize no thank you i appreciate you i care about a lot appreciate you sharing it um we're gonna um go now i i'll reshare some slides we'll talk and i will turn it over to joanne to kind of walk us through a little bit um, about what it's like to volunteer with International Medical Corps and how you can do that. And I know there's been um, some questions from participants about um, sort of opportunities if you're not an emergency physician. Um, we, we absolutely have those as well. Um, and so um, we'll turn it over to her to walk through some of the nuts and bolts. Um, but we'll say um, you can, uh, we'll say a couple of things. One, if you are interested um, after this, a session in volunteering with International Medical Corps, you can visit our website at internationalmedicalcorps.org and I will drop that um, in the chat and you um, can click on work with us. And if you search volunteer um, on our job search page, you will uh, see the opportunity to apply to join our volunteer roster. Um, and then you would be notified of, of volunteer opportunities. I will also take this time to say we are not currently sending volunteers to Turkey or Syria um, at this point, you know, to, to JR's point. Um, we actually have um, a number of local partners we're working with on the ground in, in Turkey. We are also, um, our team is working um, in Syria to provide care. And so we're not accepting volunteers for that at this time, but certainly um, are accepting uh, volunteers to join our roster for, for future opportunities or if the situation on the ground uh, should change. So I'll just say both of those things now. Um, and then we share my screen again. I can do this. Okay. Um, so oh, the first, yeah. Joanne, over to you. Yeah. All right. So after all these wonderful people have talked to you guys and uh, thoroughly convinced you that volunteering is the way to go, I come in to take it over. But essentially on the screen right now, what you will see is um, some of the most recent responses that we've been a part of. Obviously, Ukraine, COVID, Haiti. Um, and just so that you can get an idea of the number of volunteers that were deployed, the types of licenses that were deployed, and also the um, uh, activities, I want to say, that the volunteers actually did for us. Um, we can keep this on the screen or we can move on, Erica, but I can talk to any of them. Um, but essentially, how we do this is International Medical Corps maintains an emergency response roster. And so what this is, is basically a group of people who, like Tara are on it um, who have skills and that they can deploy with us. We get volunteer doctors, nurses, um, medical professionals. And what we do is we pre-interview them and complete pre-deployment paperwork, orientations, trainings, um, and anything of the like that we might need to have before a disaster strikes. Because as you've heard them say time and time again, we like to respond or we try to respond within the first 24 to 72 hours of a response. And as we all know, paperwork can take forever to complete. Training can take forever to complete. And when you're trying to leave and get your flight and get your stuff together, this is the last thing you want to do. So what we try to do is get all of that annoying stuff out of the way so that when somebody reaches out to you and say, can you deploy like tomorrow? You're like, yeah, I'm good to go. So what this means is that um, when a disaster happens, 
what somebody from our HR will contact you saying that you need to deploy. Um, and then what uh, they will do is they will tell you for how long, if it is locally, and I mean locally like within the US or close to home, it is a two week deployment. If it is internationally, we ask for a minimum of three week deployments, just because it takes time to get to the place where you are. And then of course, it, you'd be have less time on the ground. Once you're on the ground, uh, we never let you deploy without an International Medical Corps staff or an International Medical Corps team on the ground. They will always be there with you. Um, we always have a medical coordinator. Most of the times at the moment, it will be JR that will be deploying with you, um, who will be there to sort of guide you and tell you along the way what you need to do um, and how things will be stationed. Um, one of the things that we get asked a lot is who pays for my deployment? We do. International Medical Corps pays for your deployment, for your flights, for your transportation, for your um, lodging. We also offer a very modest per diem, and the keyword is modest, um, to help cover some of your foods and potentially incidentals that you will get after your deployment, um, not during. So you should always come with your things. The other thing that we get often is, well, what about um, if something happens to me or like I need to go home? Your safety is our number one priority. So if you do need to leave for whatever reason, whether something happens to you or there's an emergency at home, we will get you home as quickly as possible. Please do not worry about that. Um, the other question we get asked often is, well, what if you, you know, tell me that I can, if I can deploy and I say no because of something, like, is that going to hurt my chances to deploy with International Medical Corps again? No. Once you are on our roster, you are on our roster for a minimum of one year um, so that we, you know, at the one-year mark, will update all of your paperwork, and I will get to that in a little bit. Um, and just to check if it is still something that you want to do, but you can say no as many times as you need to, as many times as you like, and we're not going to be like, she says no, we're never calling on them again, you know, we will not do that. Um, the other question we get asked is like, what do I pack? I've never done this before. Oh my God, do I need to take a sleeping bag? Do I need to take a, a mosquito net? we will tell you what you need to pack. We will give you a list of all the things that you need to pack. We will tell you what to expect on the ground. We will give you our security information. You will be well taken care of because we want you to come and deploy with us. Again, I am sounding like a commercial. Please don't take it that way. Um, and so after all of this, then the question is, well, how do I apply? This sounds amazing. Okay, so online, you go to internationalmedicalcore.org. And CORE is C-O-R-P-S for anybody that's wondering. Um, and yes, you can go look at our volunteer section. There are specific uh, like uh, applications that you fill out if you are an MD, if you are an RN, if you are an uh, RPH, um, you know, various different clinical licenses, we have those. However, if you cannot find it, you can just apply to the general volunteer online. Um, once you do that, essentially your application will go through our system. And there's a plethora of paperwork that you will need to complete. Um, everything from a conflict of interest form to consent waivers, you know, emergency locator, medical clearances, your W-8, because we're going to give you a per diem. Um, and then, you know, volunteer conduct statements. So just, you know, the basic annoying paperwork that you have to fill. You will also have to provide copies of certain things so that, you know, we know that you're fully vaccinated, like your hepatitis and your MMR, et cetera, um, your passport, because we need to get you from point A to point B, uh, your licenses, all of your licenses, because we need to know who you are and what you can actually do. Um, if you have a dispensing license, like a DEA license, we'll ask for that, your diplomas, your resumes, you know, and any other board certifications that you want us to know about so that they can help place you better um, once we have you on our roster. And after all of that is completed, and by the way, this is all online. You don't have to submit anything via email. You don't have to you know, send in any official paperwork. We try to make it as easy as possible. So once all of that is completed, um, we may need some reference checks done, just so you know, we know who you are, 
who you say you are. Um, and then in addition to that, we do require some training. Um, you're like, why, why do I have to do some training? Well, some of it is for you and it's about 12 to 15 hours of training. It depends how fast you want to do it. Um, I've seen some people where they do it super, super quickly because they're insane in like three to four days. I've seen others that take, you know, a couple of weeks and take their time. We ask you to complete it within a month just because, you know, it gets annoying just to be sitting there. But some of the trainings that you will have to do are, you know, your code of conduct. So, you know, what we're all about. Um, sexual exploitation and abuse, just because some of the places where we go to are different than where we're used to practicing and we just have to make sure that everybody is safe. Um, something for you as well, our security training so that you know what to do in case something happens to you, um, whether it's, you know, like here in Ukraine, where there might be an air raid and you have to go into a bunker or wherever else we might be. We just want you guys to be safe. And then the one that I particularly like, which is kind of long, it's the longest one that we have, it's our building, uh, building a better response, BBR training that International Medical Corps actually helped to build. Um, and basically, this training covers the foundations of humanitarian response, um, you know, the basics, like how humanitarian is structured, like our UN clusters, which are clusters that we work with whenever we're deployed to make sure everybody is coordinating the resources appropriately, um, what international humanitarian law is, humanitarian standards, and things like that, so that for somebody who's never worked or volunteered or deployed with an NGO before, you sort of get an idea of what it's like, and so that you are not, you know, just out there doing something that you have no idea what to do, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's the basics of how you can join and sort of what it is. Um, I have been a coordinator for volunteers before. Um, and like I said, just expect the unexpected, even if it's not with us, so we would love you to volunteer for us, please come join. Um, you might see me, you might meet me. Um, but if not, um, just expect the unexpected. Um, be prepared to be self-sufficient wherever it is that you go. If you need coffee in the morning, like make sure you have those instant coffee packets with you because we all know that we all need some sort of caffeine to subsist whatever we do. So just make sure that you're self-sufficient. Be prepared for anything. And honestly, sometimes you might not be doing what you think you were going to doing, but you being there in whatever capacity is going to help whoever it is that you're there to help. Thanks, Joanne. Can you um, talk a, a little bit to us about some of the, the volunteer opportunities and, and uh, JR, you may have some been put here as well, or Catalina, but um, some of the, the opportunities that we've done that uh, with volunteers that are not um, about deploying in the field. Yeah, so quite a bit of uh, some of the volunteer stuff that we started to do actually came about through COVID and through necessity, just because we couldn't, you know, go very far and a lot of clinicians were very much had to be in their, you know, zone or their hospital area and they couldn't, you know, leave. Um, but we had to get certain messaging out to a lot of people. So what we started doing um, was quite a bit of training and capacity building to help get the word out through webinars for uh, persons that just needed to know the basics, needed to be kept up to date about, you know, what was going on um, uh, to, to be able to help others. I think even though that is volunteering from afar and the one that we've mostly talked about quite a bit, and I don't think it's Erica, so I'm just gonna steal it for a little bit, is that in addition to being able to deploy for emergency responses, um, there are sometimes opportunities where you can deploy for specific programs. Cause I know some people can't do like the emergencies, but uh, for example, during um, COVID in Juba, South Sudan, International Medical Corps established the only ICU that that was available in all of Juba. And the way we were able to do that was because the government had very specific um, people that they needed. They needed bio, uh, bioengineers, they needed a certain amount of clinicians with MDs, and they asked us if we could provide them. And so we went to our roster and because it was a project and it was going to take time to set up and all of that, we were able to get people from our roster to go and support and actually help set up this um, ICU because there was time and lead time. So in addition to emergency, there are potentials for that um, to do. But I think, JR, you might have a little bit more information about the training content because that is something that you mostly did for the Ukraine training. 
Absolutely. Um, so in terms of volunteering, uh, we had, so the, one of the biggest uses of our volunteer roster that we've had recently has been the Ukraine trauma training project that Catalina helped us work on. Basically what we did was, is that we knew that we needed, we knew that we needed to, uh, to train a lot of people in a very short amount of time. And we knew that we had a lot of talent on our roster in terms of trauma management. And so what we did was we reached out to our, our, our roster that normally deploys for emergencies and says, Hey, uh, you know, a lot of you are really experienced in trauma. A lot of you have taken ATLS or trauma nursing fundamentals or PHTLS. And we know a lot of you are actually teachers of this. And so we reached out to our existing roster, but also reached out to all of our networks to sign new people up for this specific project. And we were able to bring in, oh, wow, close to 40, maybe almost 50 people from either the roster or the, um, or specifically signed up for this project. There were all volunteers that helped train several thousand Ukrainian uh, doctors, nurses, and uh, lay people in uh, ATLS, PHTLS, trauma nursing fundamentals, CBURN, and uh, and mass casualty management. And but in addition to just volunteering, uh, I'll turn it over to Catalina to kind of give let her give you kind of like how she fit in between the kind of full time and the volunteer space. Yeah, so, you know, I think all of us will agree that your heart is always in the field, but sometimes, you know, either because of COVID or your clinical commitments, it's hard to travel. So um, IMC approached me about helping them build out some training content and things that I was an expert in, you know, um, in emergency medicine protocols in how to deal with potential airborne diseases because everyone was, you know, worried about COVID or delivering online webinars for them in English or in Spanish, because Spanish is my first language. So that's an easy one for me. Um, and so there's other ways if you can't physically volunteer at the time or be out in the field um, that you can still do um, this work. And, you know, sometimes IMC reaches out to me for, you know, review on a protocol or technical input that I can give. And that's another way that you can use your medical degree. It doesn't necessarily have to be an emergency medicine degree. Um, to do that work. And um, I think I, I saw one of the questions on the chat um, asks a lot about your fellowship or if the fellowship is required. It's not required, but there are a lot of skills that you gain from like public health and from, you know, programming and teaching that I think well suited me to be able to transition into this type of work for IMC when either they didn't have an active um, assignment going on abroad, but they still needed to deliver content or deliver training, and there were ways to do it virtually. I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much. Um, we can, I'm not sure, Joanne, if, if we have anything to add here. Um, do you want to just kind of just hit on these points again, um, as far as requirements for people who might come to the website um, and look to apply? Yeah, sure. I can definitely do that. Um, and pardon the background noise. I am in an office. Um, so there's other people coming in and out. But essentially, in terms of uh, things that you will need to have or to provide um, are, of course, your medical licenses so that uh, if you are an MD who specializes in emergency response, we'll know where to place you. If you are more geared towards infectious diseases, we'll know when to call upon you. So any, any of your licenses, any other diploma, any board certifications that you have that you would like to put forward as part of your um, your repertoire, you can totally do. Uh, the other thing that we need is your immunization records. We do have a certain amount of required immunizations for all deployments. These include your hepatitis A and B, your MMR, um, and COVID. We do require COVID. One dose for J&J &J or two doses if you're the other type. Your yellow fever is required if you're going to international deployments only. And of course, there might be other immunizations that we require for specific deployments, which if there are, we will let you know about those um, ahead of time. We do need your passport and it has to be a color copy um, because as I said, we will be the ones who will be arranging all of your travel and your transportation. Sometimes it is a plane, sometimes it is a bus, sometimes it is a car. So we just need to have 
uh, your passport to ensure that we're able to get that. If there's any visas that are required to enter where we are, um, so we will need a copy of your passport. Um, and of course, your resume and CV uh, will be things that we will need. Other things, uh, paperwork, background that we will need to have you sign are your authorization for a background check, your conflict of interest, um, consent release waiver of liability, uh, an electronic signature, emergency locator, all that means is that um, we know who to contact in case something does happen. Um, your medical clearance, this will require signature by a medical health provider, and we can provide you additional details of what exactly that means. Um, we'll need a W-8 for uh, non-US citizens, uh, but a tax form essentially, we'll need your tax form because of the per diem that we provide, and we'll need a volunteer conduct of state from your employer or a reference just to ensure that everything is done. Uh, and then the other thing would be the training that I mentioned, um, about 12 to 15 hours worth of training, online modules that you will get access to once you've gone through up to a certain point of the um, onboarding process. We will be the ones who will give you access to this training. And it, like I said, it includes things from code of conduct uh, to security to just letting you know how the humanitarian sector works. Thank you. Um, I see we're getting a number of, of, of questions about some of the um, nuts and bolts, I would say, of, of the process. And so I guess um, for any of our panelists, there's been a few questions about sort of how to negotiate the ability to deploy with your employer and whether that's something you should do up front, how to have that conversation, um, how to ensure that um, you know, you're being upfront and transparent, but also have the opportunity to deploy as part of your um, should it be part of your interview process? I guess any, um, I'll, I'll just kind of open it up and see, does anybody have any sort of thoughts or, or tips on that? So I can actually talk about that. I'm newer at my job now. So I, I was looking for work two years ago and I was very honest with everyone that I interviewed that this is something that I do, that I do work that's abroad that I sometimes don't always know and did actively try to negotiate that into my contracts. You get mixed responses with that. Um, but I will say, especially at two of those places, they were very open to that. Um, and I think there's other ways to go about that too. So I kind of call it like um, building social capital. So being that friend who will pick up a shift and then being like, I may, you know, I may need it later um, during hurricane season, or I may need it later because I know that I'm working on this Ukraine project and travel's coming up. Um, and so I think being a helpful colleague has also helped me get help in return. I'm also, um, and I know that this is not everyone's experience, so I, I don't pretend this to be the case for everyone, but I work at a place that has a global health division where we can help each other out. Um, but that is something that I actively did negotiate for and ask for in my working contracts. Great, thank you so much. Saul or Tara, do you have any, any tips on this? Um, I can speak to corporate medicine side of how to navigate things. I, it took me a long time to get permission from my chief to be able to do this. Uh, eventually, I had to threaten to quit <laughs> so I could be allowed to do it. But once I got permission and they realized that it, it, it didn't really hurt the department for me to be gone, uh, it opened up more opportunities. And I second what Catalina said, which is you have to pick up shifts from your coworkers on days that you don't want to work so they can pick up shifts for you during hurricane season or any deployment that's coming up. I've been pretty lucky. I have a very good, I had a very good group of coworkers who were always very supportive and picked up my shifts so I would be able to go. And their reasoning was always, I can't go because I'm not at that stage in my life by taking your shift. I'm, I feel like I'm doing something. Uh, so, so be nice to your coworkers. <laughs> that would be the big tip. Thanks. Saul? Yes. Uh, so when I first started off, I, I was in the full-time academic sector at that time. And, uh, uh, it was something coming out of the fellowship was expected kind of as part of the negotiation of the contract. And so it was uh, something that was already going to come to the table. So I did have something negotiated. Um, but the tell is I didn't actually stay very long. And it wasn't really because of the employers or other other you know colleagues. They were actually very good about kind of helping out during a, um, 
uh, during deployment times. Uh, it, it, in some ways, actually, it was just very tired in a way. I would uh, come back, lost 10 pounds, maybe recover from malaria, and then have to go get off the plane and go straight to your shift because you had worked right up to the doorstop. Uh, and so I'd left full time at that point. And then I had shifted over to locums. I would say a majority of my time has been primarily in the locums area where I would stay contracted for at a minimum of four hospitals um, at the same time. Um, so if I was around, I could always fill in some needs. When I was around, I um, it's kind of like what Catalina was saying, was always open to help out, um, picking up shifts, picking up weekend shifts, picking up weekend night shifts. Um, I would always, uh, try to be the person that if there was something um, at bay or at issue, uh, um, I'd be like the first person to call. And so that uh, when I'm, you know, when I'm gone, um, it's less felt. Uh, and when I'm around, it's appreciated. Uh, and so that when I'm around, uh, shifts were always kind of available and kind of called upon. And if I wasn't around, uh, um, I wasn't, I really wasn't around. So forth. Uh, I found keeping four hospitals was a kind of a pretty good um, number uh, to try to still keep up with some of the administrative requirements of keeping your credentials, uh, but also having some flexibility and availability for, for when you deploy. I also worked full-time uh, in terms of emergency response for two years uh, with that model. And it worked fairly well for me for two years. Yes. Great, thank you. And JR, I know you do quite a bit of this. I don't know if you have any kind of additional tips be nice, take bad shifts. You can have anything you want, but not everything that you want. <laughs> my, yes, there you go. It's one of my favorite things. Um, and then also, JR, and we're getting a, a number of questions about um, sort of certifications uh, to apply for the roster and questions about if you can, if you need to do a fellowship, um, if you um, can apply if you're in residency. And I don't know if you can go ahead and, and answer that for everybody. Of course, absolutely. Uh, you certainly do not have to have a fellowship. Uh, all of a, a lot of us have have done fellowships and have found them helpful, but you certainly do not. Uh, we are not able to accept residents as clinical providers, but we are able to accept residents in non-clinical roles. We are definitely able to accept fellows as long as you are board eligible or board certified, then you can uh, practice clinical medicine with us. Great, thank you. Um, we're just about at time, so I do want to see, um, you know, we'll encourage everybody to kind of get in um, their last questions, um, but also um, wanted to ask the group um, before we close, and I know some of you have talked about this, but, but what keeps you motivated? You've talked a lot about how this work can be really difficult, it can be challenging, you can come back with malaria, um, and so it, it's not easy, um, but I guess what, what keeps you going and what keeps you wanting to to go back for more um, and maybe this time i'll start with Saul. okay thanks rebecca um yeah i guess it's uh it's it, it's the field is it's it's very humbling the work is very humbling um the events the contexts are just massive and you know they're catastrophic and you know you, you know as what was kind of discussed earlier you will always kind of come home with a sense that maybe what more could you have done? Um, if I maybe slept a little bit less, I could have done this, you know, as you know, as well. And so it's it it becomes a, a field where you are constantly pushing yourself and 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 uh, um, very uh, motivated to continue to grow and learn more, so you can bring more to your next response. Um, I would say. Probably you would never get a sense that you got everything that you wanted done out there, but uh, you can continue to strive and continue to you know work uh, work forward to at the same time. Um, and ideally, hopefully, the next response you know, you feel a little bit better about it, you know, like towards the end. And uh, um, and uh, that little bit um, um, it's 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 a little bit exciting. It's kind of exciting. Thank you, Catalina. Um, I think there's a lot of things that keep me going. I think one of it is that there, again, I'm very motivated to do things, to change things that I don't like. Um, and I really appreciate that IMC is like so community driven in their responses, um, because I think that's a really fair criticism of the humanitarian um, sector. 
But I think one of the things that always sticks with me is that the expertise and the incredible knowledge of the people that I meet um, in their countries and who are responding in their own countries always pales in comparison to the things that I've learned in a book or in a class, right? Um, there is so much expertise to be found and so much that I, I always say, I'm never here to teach you anything. I'm always here to learn and you learn so much. Um, and you know, your experience can sometimes just be another day in their lives, but if you're really open to it, they, you will learn and you will grow from it and then be a better physician when you go back home or a better friend or a better, you know, family member. And I think that's it's like kind of one of the things that keeps me going. And I think it's really important to experience how other people live and then actively work to do something about it. Um, and yeah, um, whenever IMC wants to call me, I'm there. Thank you. Joanne, how about you? You're in Ukraine right now. Uh, Cause I'm a little insane. No, <laughs> um, no, honestly it's, um, when people when people say you work for a humanitarian or you deployed to a humanitarian situation, um, you get a lot of people who say, "Oh my God, thank you so much for your work. Thank you for all that you do," um, and it feels like you you haven't really done anything. Um, but when you go out and you go to the field and you're able to help these people, sometimes all they want to do is have somebody who will listen to them and listen to their stories. Sometimes it does require a lot more, like mm -hmm. surgery. Um, but just the fact that you are able to go and be there for somebody and help in any way, shape or form as little or as much as you can, when they are probably going through some of the toughest times of their life that they may ever experience. Um, it's not because you want to go there and be like, you know, feel good about yourself. It's really, you just, you just want to help. And when you're able to help in any way, it just, the sleepless nights, the, light insanity, the, the sickness that you could potentially get from doing all of that, it really does make it worth it because it's just humanity, you, one person helping another. Thank you. JR? I echo every single thing that everybody has said. Uh, you know, people are sometimes the problem, but always the solution. And I, uh, it's, it's it's a it's a pleasure to be in a situation where you are not bound by like algorithms and protocols and the situation the problems that you that arise are cannot be possibly put into simple solutions and so it's a different way of thinking and you need a team to do it and the 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 people that you help and the people that you work with are the reason thank you and Tara um, everything everybody's already said the only thing I'll add is it's a great feeling to be out there after an acute disaster because the whole community comes together and you're basically seeing the best of humanity in action where everybody's supporting each other taking care of each other looking out for each other I love being a part of it although a very small part of it I love being a part of it thank you um, Vinay, I'll turn it back over to you, but I know you volunteered with us and with others as well, so I'll let you answer the question too, if you'd like. Uh, <clears throat> I, yeah, I just got uh, my first appointment with IMC a couple months ago, and it was awesome. I was able to finally meet Catalina, which was great. Um, but I, this has definitely been uh, an important part of my life work, and um, I cannot imagine it another way. Uh, and I, you know, I, there's a quote that I think of, uh, it's uh, by Leela Watson, um, and the quote is that if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time, but if you've come because your liberation's bound up with mine, then let us work together. And I think that that really embodies the work that IMC does, that's the spirit of IMC, that's the spirit of why we do the work that we do, and that's what keeps me going. Thank you. Uh, I think that's it from our end, but I, I'll, I'll, I don't know if you have any other kind of final closing remarks, but just really want to thank all of my colleagues for, for being here with us today and, and everybody who made the time to join this call. Yes, incredible thanks to you, Erica, JR, Tara, Joanne, Catalina, and Saul. 
incredible thanks to SAEM. There's been uh, a, an amazing team that all have their cameras off right now, but they have been sort of the nuts and bolts of making this happen. Um, so there are links in the chat um, to get involved with IMC, to get involved with GEMA and SAEM, um, to join GEMA. You have my contact information. So there's definitely ways to keep this conversation going. And uh, we look forward to getting to know you and working with you in, out in the world. Thank you again.